executives globally. Born in Jodhpur, Rajasthan, India, Alka has lived in the US since the age of nine. She graduated from Stanford University and worked in the field of advertising and PR before she started her own marketing consultancy. In 2011, she obtained her MFA in creative writing from the California College of Art in San Francisco. And the result, I think, I presume uh, it had a little bit of to contribute the result was The Henna Artist, which is a first novel, and it has been translated, in, already translated into 18 languages. The novel is about 17-year-old Lakshmi escaping from an arranged and abusive marriage, uh, and, uh, you know, is set in around 1950 in, rural, uh, in a rural village adjacent to the pink city of Jaipur in Rajasthan. It is a story about how she becomes the henna artist and the confidant of several wealthy women belonging to the upper class, class in that city and all her trials and tribulations and how her uh, very strong spirit uh, you know, is reflected in the book and that is what makes it very special. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Nairobi, Alka. We are truly delighted to have you with us over Zoom, especially as it is not yet dawn where you are. And we really appreciate, you know, the fact that you have done this for us. Thank uh, while you. Some us, uh, while some of us may have read this book, and I have a copy here, so you see some of us have picked it up, and some of us have taken a Kindle edition. Uh, a lot of us would not have really read it. So uh, I would like you to, you know, talk about it and uh, discuss how it came about. And I would like to tell all Rotarians that the book is already has been so well received that it is now a Miramax TV project. It is a New York Times bestseller. It is a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. It is an LA Times bestseller. It's a USA Today bestseller. It's a Toronto Star bestseller. It's a Globe and Mail bestseller. It's an India Bookstores bestseller. And it is long listed as a first novel center for fiction. It is the Amazon Summer 2020 Reader's Pick. Indigo Best Book of 2020, HCC Spring 2020 Fan Choice Winner. And uh, I'm sure uh, there are a few things which have been added in between the time I got this list and now. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would like to invite you to tell about your fantastic journey. And I would request members to send in their questions to Ritesh and I so that we can compile them and ask Alka to answer them after her, you know, after, her, after she shares what she has to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, let's see, good morning to everyone or good afternoon, based, uh, depending on where you are. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning. I call myself an accidental writer. And the reason for that is that I never started off life thinking I'm going to be a writer someday. I'm going to have a book published, much less three books published uh, within a couple of years. Um, and so what happened to me is that in 2008, when the mortgage crisis hit the world and especially hit, I think, America really hard, uh, it hit my business hard. I had been running my own marketing and advertising consultancy by, uh, for 20 years by then. And uh, many of my projects got canceled because a lot of budgets got cut. And so I thought, well, what am I gonna do with myself? Oh, I know, during a recession, one of the best things to do is to go back to college and get yourself a, an advanced degree. So I thought, all right, it's time for me to get an MFA. And my husband had been uh, telling me that I could write fiction. She's a speaker. And so I had... Um, uh, I, I had thought, okay, well, you know, maybe I can write uh, fiction, but I don't really know because I'm used to writing small pieces of advertising copy and a 30 second uh, TV commercial here, uh, a minute radio spot there. And, uh, but I thought, all right, you know, why not give it a try? So I went into the MFA program. And at the same time, several things happened. Number one, uh, my brother bought a condo in Jaipur in India, Rajasthan, where we have a lot of our extended family. And uh, he did it so that my parents could go back and forth and visit with their friends and family. So my mother said, 
hey, I would like to go back and forth and Elka, will you please uh, accompany me uh, and then just leave me there for a couple of months and come back and get me when your semester is over. So that turned out really well in conjunction with my schedule at the MFA program. And I think over the course of two and a half years, I made five different trips to India, to Jaipur. So uh, the second thing that happened is that I got a chance to spend a lot of time with my mother, which I hadn't done since I had left for college. And during that time that we spent together, I got to know my mother's girlhood because we went to the fruit market and got the fruit that she loved to eat that she can't get in the United States. We went to Agra, which is where she was born and where she went to school. We went to visit her school and the headmistress there. Uh, we went to uh, the Jaffer Palace and she told me about the time that she had had an audience with the Maharani Gayatri Devi. Uh, we also, you know, stopped in front of the Hawa Mahal and we had a kulfi there and she told me about all of the ladies behind the jolly at one point who used to be looking out uh, at all of the public going by. So uh, I really gained an appreciation for what my mother was like as a girl and the kinds of things she liked to do do and read and eat and hang out with her friends and so on. And I started thinking, what would mom's life have been like had her father not taken her out of college at the age of 18 and uh, had an arranged marriage? Uh, what would have happened if my mom hadn't had three children in rapid succession? And what would have happened if she hadn't been of service to my father and also to my brothers and me for the rest of her life? what would she have done in terms of making a living? How would she have spent her time? And this is where the henna artist was born. So uh, Lakshmi is our henna artist. When we meet up with her in the book, she is 30 years old. She has been for 13 years uh, 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 away from a husband that she deserted in a small village, but now she lives in Jaipur and she's a celebrated henna artist to the elite women of Jaipur. And I based it in 1955 because that was the year that my parents were married. It was also the year that divorce became legal. So now Lakshmi is in a position where she can legalize this, this uh, separation from her husband as opposed to uh, just sort of pretending that uh, you know, her husband might have abandoned her because nobody really knows what happened to her husband. And also I wanted to base it in 1955 because it's close enough to independence that we know that India is still uh, establishing itself as an independent country. We know that there's a lot of infrastructure that's being rebuilt. We know that Indians are feeling very uh, proud of the fact that they have their country back, that they can set their own policies, that they can determine how they wanna educate their own children. So uh, it's a time of exuberance and excitement in India, and I wanted to capture that in the novel. Additionally, what was easy for me to mine uh, in terms of research at that time was the fact that both my parents were born in the 30s and then were alive during independence and were married after independence and had their children. So they were around that whole period and I could actually count on them to tell me a lot of their stories and what life was like back then. So, and I was born in 1958, so that, uh, you know, a lot of my memories also came into play as I started writing about Jaipur. We lived in Rajasthan until I was nine years old, and we had moved around to four different cities. We'd even lived up in Punjab in Chandigarh for one year while my father was getting his uh, first master's degree. So, uh, you know, we're doing, uh, mom, and, mom and I are going back and forth. I'm writing this novel. Uh, it starts taking shape and then it becomes my thesis, as Rashmi said. Uh, and I, my mom is present during my thesis reading and I get to introduce her as my muse. And she has already given me her blessing on the book. She kept saying, honey, this is really good. I hope you keep going. Uh, then she unexpectedly died uh, about eight months after my thesis reading while I was polishing up the novel. And then I just stopped working on it for uh, two years. Um, and then my mentor called me one, one year and said, hey, how is that novel coming along? So I started uh, dusting it off and I read it and I thought, oh, I like this world. I like where Lakshmi is. I want to continue working with her. 
So I started working on the novel again. I sent the novel to my mentor and said, well, I polished it up some more. What do you think? She sent it off to her agent. Next thing I know, her agent is calling me and saying, I love this novel. I love the whole idea of it. I like the characters. Let's go ahead and uh, represent you. But I need you to fix these things in the novel. So then for four more years, she works with me on making changes to the novel. At the end of four years, I finally said, well, now, when are we going to be ready to publish this? Because surely we're getting close, right? And she said, oh, gosh, no. I have taken you as far as I can take you. And now I need you to get a book editor. Because that is the kind of person who needs to read your novel and let us know exactly uh, what's going to happen and uh, how you can strengthen the novel, how you can strengthen the characters. And I said, oh my gosh, I thought we had been editing this whole time. But then I did find a book editor and then she started working with me. Uh, she gave me about 15 pages of corrections, changes, suggestions for strengthening the novel. And I was kind of blown away because I was hoping that she was going to say, oh, your novel is so publishable. There's hardly anything that needs to be done. It's, it's perfect just the way it is. But that's not what she said. So then I spend the next year and a half working on her changes. And finally, when I get her changes done, then I go back to my agent and I say, okay, now are we ready to publish? And she said, well, I don't know. You know, we may have a couple more things we have to do. And I said, oh my gosh, Emma, we have to get this novel out the door because I've been working on this for nine years. I would really like to have something happen uh, to this novel. So she said, okay, okay. Uh, she sold it within a couple of months. And then I got a new editor, an editor at the publishing house. My publisher is Mira Books, which is a division of HarperCollins. So then I have a new editor and now she is working with me on some changes. But I thought, you know, I'm so close. I can't give up now. It's been nine years. Now I'm working on it. It'll just take me one more year and, and we will have it published. Sure enough, on March the 3rd, we're ready to get this book published. HarperCollins has done everything they possibly can to pre-sell the book in all the bookstores, uh, to get the, you know, all of the uh, PR out. Uh, they've got the book in the hands, I guess, of Reese Witherspoon. Um, you know, they, they're, they've done everything they possibly can. They've scheduled a tour for me in the U.S. and Canada, and then COVID hits. So suddenly, every single book event is canceled. Every single uh, opportunity that I could have had to talk to readers is canceled. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I spent all of these years writing this novel and now I cannot even get it into the hands of readers. Um, Amazon is no longer delivering anything but essential supplies. All of the bookstores are closing, all the libraries are closing. <laughs> I just thought, what kind of karma am I carrying around in this life that is making it so hard for me to talk to readers? And then Reese Witherspoon calls. And that really turned everything around because she gave me uh, enough encouragement uh, to keep going for the next month and a half while we were developing content for the social media for the Reese Witherspoon Book Club. And I'm writing about saris and I'm writing about jewelry and I'm writing about uh, food and I'm making cooking videos and so on. So we do all of that, we get all of that done. And then uh, May 1st hits and Reese gets to announce uh, that she has chosen the henna artist. And now suddenly I'm getting calls from a uh, book club saying, you know, would you please talk to us? Would you please talk to us? So uh, now at this point, I have closed in on almost 200 book clubs uh, on Zoom. So I'm almost as good on Zoom as you are, Ritesh. <laughs> Um, so uh, it's been a great opportunity all around the world. I'm talking to readers uh, who are uh, inspired by the book, women who feel that this book is really showing them that at any age in their lives, they can do something very different, or maybe they can follow a passion that they had, had earlier that they might have given up. Uh, it's also uh, inspiring a uh, lot of young Indians along the diaspora all over the world who are also having an opportunity to learn a little bit about India during those um, uh, exciting times right after independence. So that's been really fun, uh, you know, to, to be able to talk to readers 
uh, that are French and Russian and Polish and Chilean and Peruvian and uh, Spanish. Uh, I've just talked to so many different people and it's been a marvelous journey. So that is my 10 year journey to publication. And now we're finally at the point where we started entertaining offers from screen adaptation companies. Uh, I chose to go with the team uh, that had Frida Pinto as an executive producer and wanting to star as Lakshmi in the TV series. So uh, now I'm playing an executive producer role where we are working on the episodes, we're working on the writing in the writer's room, and then shortly thereafter we will start figuring out how to cast it and you know how to, uh, what kind of director would be uh, the best for this production and so on. So it, the whole thing has been a great learning experience. I feel like I'm learning something new every day about the writing, publishing, and marketing process. Um, I would love to take questions from any of you if you would like to ask. Uh, anything about writing, anything about publishing, uh, anything about publishing in the United States, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, uh, Alka. And uh, we're actually going to have a small uh, segment here where Rashmi and I will ask you a few questions and then we will open the floor to all the uh, members who have joined us to ask their questions. Uh, thanks, Satish, and thank you, Alka. I think this was such an insight into how you went around writing your book. But uh, while I was reading it, what really fascinated uh, me is that how you managed to assimilate the cultural and social norms of mid-50s India in the book with such ease. Because you, you know, if you look at your background, you, you've been in the States and Canada most of the time. And uh, how, do, how, do, how did you do that, you know, because uh, I, was, it, was it the most difficult part of putting yourself in a, actually an alien culture, even if you were there until you were nine years old? Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, sure. I think that there are several reasons why I was able to infuse it with so much culture and history. Uh, number one, as I said, my parents were both uh, alive during that time and, of course, very active in India at that time. So I was able to gather a lot of information from them, just, you know, tiny little things. My father speaks in Proverbs, so I was able to infuse the entire uh, uh, novel with lots of Proverbs. Uh, my mother, I watched my mother cook and I cooked with her. So I know about all of the recipes that I put in the book and also um, the way that Indian spices are used to enhance the body, that, that all of those spices are used. Um, I think you just learn from a very young age as an Indian person that every single spice that we use is uh, meant to be of benefit to the lymphatic system, the digestive system, the brain, the skin, you know, all of that. Um, and then I did some research. Of course, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of Indian authors, uh, Tagore and Narayan and um, uh, uh, let's see, the Desai, uh, Anita Desai and Kiran Desai and um, Kamala Markandaya, you know, Rohinton Mystery, a lot of different authors across the diaspora who have written so beautifully about India. Uh, I also watched a lot of movies during that time. And there was one movie in particular in 1955 called Mr. and Mrs. 55, and it starred Madhubala, and, uh, and whom I mentioned, of course, in the novel, and what a phenomenal actor she was. I did a lot of research on Madhubala because I found her fascinating. And um, uh, I also did a lot of research on the Maharani Gayatri Devi, who is my model for the younger Maharani in the novel, The Henna Artist. Uh, the younger Maharani also starts a school uh, in the book, just as the Maharani Gayatri Devi started her school, uh, which is the MGD school that still exists today, and a lot of prominent families send their daughters there to be educated and to have a seat at the global table, which is what uh, the Maharani had wanted to have happen. Uh, so I had the, the book that Ma, the Maharani had written, uh, which gave me a lot of insight into what palace living is all about and the kinds of powers that Maharanis have or don't have. Um, 
And then of course I talked to a lot of people when I was in Jaipur who were alive during that time and asked them a lot of questions. So part of my research also just came from in, informal interviews that I did with a lot of people and I took lots of notes. I have tiny little notebooks filled with lots and lots and lots of notes, <laughs> lots of research notes. And the thing is that when you do research as a fiction author, you can only use a very small a percentage of that research in your work. You cannot actually do a brain dump of research. You have to somehow find a way to organically infuse your fiction with what you are discovering about history and politics and uh, culture of that time. So that is something that I uh, really had a lot of joy in doing. And then I think, uh, I think that what I wanted to really convey in this novel, and it didn't become apparent to me right away, it became apparent to me, I think maybe halfway through writing this book, that what I was really trying to do in also reinventing my mother's life was to reinvent the India that I came from. So when we were immigrants to the United States in 1967, I, we got a lot of questions uh, about where we came from. And if we said we were from India, we were asked things like, oh, is that somewhere near Texas? Or uh, we were asked things like, uh, where did you get your tan? Uh, you know, hey, I've just always been the skin color. I didn't really understand what a tan was. Or they asked us questions that really led me to believe that what they thought about India was that it was a starving, illiterate, kind of a dirty place, and certainly not any place that they would choose to go which surprised me because that wasn't the India of my youth. You know, that wasn't the India of my experience. And I wanted to, I think, reprise in this novel, the India of the 1950s that I remembered, uh, which is a very vibrant, a very colorful India, a place where there is a lot of discussion about science and math and culture and literature that's going on. Uh, a place where people are trying to learn progressive ways from the outside world and bring them to India so that India can prosper. And it's also a place of a lot of resilience. And I think maybe um, uh, Kenya is really uh, uh, the same kind of place where you have people who have been oppressed for many years or have had um, invaders, colonizers, all kinds of people try to rob the country of its riches, but the people still stand. The people are still resilient enough to withstand any kind of assault on their uh, land. And I think that this is something Indians have been able to do really amazingly uh, in their own country, uh, that even after millennia of having the British, the Mughals, the Europeans, uh, all kinds of folks invade India, that India is still standing. The Indian diaspora is strong around the world, that they uh, have this amazing um, uh, ability to incorporate the traditional with the modern, always. Thank you uh, so much, Anka, for giving such a beautiful answer to my very simple question. <laughs> I have another question for you, which, which concerns Lakshmi, your protagonist in the movie, in the book, and now hopefully a movie, who gets tempered with every reversal to emerge stronger, and with every setback she actually sort of, you know, comes out, it seems with great ease. Is that how you see women, like uh, succeeding despite setbacks? and? Have you modeled her on somebody, somebody like known, unknown, or is, is she an amalgamation of several people? Lakshmi is an amalgamation of my mother and her resilience and her ability to adapt to whatever circumstances she found herself in. And also uh, she's a combination of me too. So, um, you know, I don't know where my mother ends and where, where I begin within Lakshmi. Um, so Lakshmi is, uh, I think, like a lot of women, extremely resilient. She can withstand so many setbacks and still come out and say, okay, how can I go around this new obstacle? How can I figure out a creative way 
to overcome this new obstacle that's been placed in front of me. I think that women, because they have the ability to have children and because they are the major caretakers of children, they deal with this kind of challenge every single day of their lives. How do I meet this new obstacle? And how do I go around it? I do feel that women are like water. I think they have this ability to go around obstacles rather than butting their heads uh, directly with the obstacle. So that is something I wanted to show that Lakshmi is able to do. She is able to go around the obstacle rather than spending too much energy hitting it head on. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, answer. And uh, if, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions too before we open the floor. Sure. Um, mine is also a, a quite a simple question. Uh, after the super successful first novel, which has taken you 10 years, um, it's usually followed by a second or a third. And you, you mentioned in the beginning uh, three books. Could you please tell us more about what you have in the works and related to this, um, did you ever think that uh, you would carry your story to Africa? Now, to <laughs> and, uh, can you uh, you have outlined the journey, uh, uh, you know, with uh, your publishers and all? But could you please share some more? Because I think uh, we, we, are, we are very interested to know more. Uh, well, you, let me answer the second question first. No, I never would have imagined that this book would have touched the lives of so many people around the world. I really thought I was writing for, uh, you know, English speaking audiences, uh, largely in the West and perhaps in India. I had no idea that uh, there would be so many translations of it all around the world and that readers everywhere would find something in the novel, a character or a dilemma or a situation that they can really relate to personally. I've had so many letters and emails from readers telling me that the book has touched them and, and either inspired them to change their lives or to do something different with their lives, or it's brought them closer to their mothers because there is a uh, generational difference in the novel that helps mothers and daughters somehow communicate better. And uh, I really encourage when I talk to readers, if, the, if I'm talking to younger people, I say, please talk to your mothers, ask them about what their lives were like, because you may find out something about them that you didn't know earlier. And I also tell my older readers, you know, if you can, please write down what uh, you used to do as a child. What are the games you played? What are the kinds of things that you did that brought you joy? What are the things that brought you solace? Um, so that is the answer to your first question. Took me completely by surprise, the uh, sort of global reach of the henna artist. The two books that I'm writing, uh, the sequel is coming out in July of next year. And it did not take me very long because I've lived with these characters now for 10 years. So I feel like I know so much about them. I know how they would react in any given situation. And the, the novel, the second novel actually almost wrote itself. And now I'm in the final stages of the editing. And as soon as that is out the door, I'm gonna start working on the third novel. The second novel deals with, of course, the main character, Lakshmi, and then her helper, Malik. Uh, and he is 20 years old in the second novel. So we have advanced 12 years uh, in the sequel. And then the third novel will deal with Radha, who is only 13 years old in The Henna Artist. But in the third novel, she will be 35 and she has her own career and she lives in France. She is a perfumer. Uh, and so we're going to encounter her and of course, many of the other same characters in the novel as well. And why did I set it in France? It's because I want to go to France. I want to write this in France. I want to eat French food. <laughs> so that was my entire reason for setting the third novel in France. <laughs> well, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. And uh, we look forward to the next edition. But at the same time, uh, I think for the, for, the, for the book, which follows the sequel, uh, it has to be uh, placed in Africa. So that'll give you a <laughs> Well, okay then. Uh, so I'm looking now for um, 
people to invite me to their home so I can stay there for three months and, and write. <laughs> who's, who's, who's volunteering? <laughs> I, think, I think we'll all volunteer, honestly. And uh, we have uh, a question from Rashmi before we open the floor. Sure. Actually, I think uh, you partially answered it, but uh, this, this concerns with, you know, uh, I look at it in a very broad, um, very top view kind of a thing into the book and not get into the details. It, it is basically a story about uh, women not getting the environment that they need, require, or dream of. And though it, it ends in a very beautiful, happy ending for Lakshmi and also for Radha, uh, do you think things have changed much in India, in the world actually, not just in India? Is is womanhood all about you know trying to trying to overcome things and then then and then make a success of things? Or how do you how is the difference like 1955 and now? What is the difference that you see? You know, I went to India last year to answer this very question because I knew I would be asked it. So I went to five different cities and I talked to women, young women of marriageable ages. Many of them are getting their BAs or their MAs or their doctorates because uh, the Indian middle class has grown so much that they are able to send their sons and daughters to um, a lot of colleges. And these young people are now able to uh, mingle with people from different castes, different classes while they're in college. So I found that there are more love marriages now as a result of more of this interaction uh, outside of their family circle. Um, so maybe in my mother's time, we might have had 90% arranged marriages. Maybe now it's more like 70% of arranged marriages are happening and the rest are either love marriages or maybe people deciding not to marry. Uh, the other change I found was that women are able to put off getting married a little bit longer. So that in my mother's day, while 18 would have been a spinster, now it's the age of 30 that is a spinster. And so the family starts panicking if the girl is not married or she's getting close to 30 and she's not married. Um, the other uh, constant that I found is that regardless of when a woman gets married, she is expected to always have a child. That hasn't changed. Uh, I think a lot of women around the world, when they get married, they are just expected to have children. And one of the things I'm trying to say, I think, with Lakshmi is that there are women who don't want to have children, and that should be okay, too. That women should have choices all around the world, um, regardless of uh, what kind of society they are raised in. They should be able to have choices, but they don't always. And women, I think, find agency no matter what limited boundary they are given. That is one of the things that you notice in the book uh, that you talked about just a little while ago. Uh, every woman in the book has found some way to get some sort of power within her small uh, area that she lives in. I mean, even the Maharanis who have a lot of wealth and prestige, they still have social prisons that they live within. They are, there are still things they are not able to do uh, that maybe uh, somebody from a lower socioeconomic class is able to do, but the woman from the lo lower socioeconomic class doesn't have the wealth uh, to be able to afford a large house or afford a lot of nice things for her children. So, you know, um, I think that women uh, adapt, and I think what I'm trying to say in the novel is that a lot of these women, um, you know, they have, I think women have come far in some ways, but there has also been some backtracking, and there are always opportunities to give women even more power. I think when women are given more power, they definitely rise to the occasion. They definitely make more uh, than anybody expected them to make uh, of their situation and of the circumstances they're in. Thank you. Thank you, Alka. Uh, we have a few questions from uh, you know, participants, from other Rotarians. And there's a question from uh, Margareta, who's also in California. Uh, she's asking that uh, uh, 
<laughs> just a she, uh, she, uh, Margaret is asking if you feel that your story contrasts with the tragic life of many Indian women. Margaret, you can unmute yourself and please ask your question. Yes, well, we hear so many stories about um, um, uh, discrimination against women and the problem of rape. And um, I wonder how you feel your own life contrasts with, with that of what we hear about so many Indian women having this problem of, of men and groping and, and the submissiveness or the, the difficulty of women in India. Does this come well, out in your book? Well, uh, Margareta, uh, the, there is, yes, there are overtones of women in vulnerable positions who constantly have to be vigilant about men who might want to take advantage of them. And I do not think that this is just common to Indian women. I believe this is a situation all around the world. For example, here in the United States, we wouldn't have people like Harvey Weinstein and uh, you know people like President Trump uh, who have groped women and taken advantage of them if this were not a worldwide phenomenon that vulnerable women always have to be vigilant everywhere. I agree, I agree. But I think we just heard a story about, a, um, I, I mean, I don't even want to talk about it, but a gang rape and then she's murdered and, um, you know, I mean, some really horror stories that come to us that make us feel that the, the plight of um, Indian women is uh, horrific. So, I mean, well, your story is a wonderful contrast. Well, I think that um, we're looking at different socioeconomic levels here. So, uh, if you are from a higher socioeconomic uh, class, then you are more protected. You have more uh, people looking out for you. I think that the women in the so lower socioeconomic classes are the vulnerable ones, the most vulnerable. Yeah. And they are the yes. ones that are yes. subjected to uh, more of this um, heavy handed power uh, by the patriarchy. So uh, yeah, I think that that does happen. And I also think that it happens in almost um, every developing country. Uh, you know, uh, almost every country where the patriarchy is very strong, I think you run into this issue with vulnerable women, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, We've got uh, two questions actually from Megha Shankar Seth. And uh, uh, Megha, would you like to kindly unmute and ask your questions? Yeah, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. Miss Joshi, I love your lipstick. I just absolutely do. And I was just checking you on Amazon, just checking out your book. And, uh, you know, I love your hair and your lipstick. Even there, it is just right there. <laughs> the perfect oh, color. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to ask, actually, I was just thinking about two questions. So I was going through a BBC documentary on an artist in UK. So it is about women. And some of them are second uh, generation citizens. Do you think they're inspired by you because they came out and said that COVID has ruined our lives and you know, we can't go to college, we can't do our own stuff that we were doing beforehand. And Hina is what keeps us going. So <laughs> would you want to comment on that? Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with my book, but uh, after writing my book, I have come into contact with so many henna artists across the world. I didn't really know henna artists until I wrote the book. Uh, you know, henna is just something that we young Indian women always grow up with. You know, we see our aunties with henna. We see everybody at a wedding with henna. And, you know, you just kind of grow up around it. So I knew about henna. I had not met a lot of henna artists in my life whom I had talked to. But since writing the book, I found out some amazing things about henna artists around the world, especially the ones that are making henna crowns for cancer patients who have lost their hair. And so they are putting these beautiful designs all over the skull and able to uh, change the conversation around those women 
from one of pity, for example, when they go to the grocery store, people aren't just looking at them thinking, oh no, that woman has cancer, but more uh, they're looking at the woman and saying, wow, where did you get that beautiful design? And those do those designs mean something? The other thing I learned is that while I had only imagined the henna in the book as something that Lakshmi creates, because I'm an artist and it's easy for me to imagine a, a lot of design in my head, uh, I didn't realize that there are actually women out there who on pregnant bellies will do a lot of henna. So there is belly henna that is done for pregnant women. I had only imagined it in my book. Um, but uh, the kind of henna that Lakshmi does is still a very unusual kind of henna that I've never seen any woman in the world do. And that is a very kind of representational henna. So if a woman wants to have a, um, an amorous afternoon in bed with her husband, then Lakshmi does that little fig and the wasp henna on the uh, part of these feet uh, to help engender that. So um, there is a lot of representational henna that she does. It just comes out of her imagination. Most henna artists will be fusing Arabic design with uh, Hindi pattern, Hindu patterns with um, maybe some African patterns, with some Persian patterns, uh, with some, uh, you know, uh, Middle Eastern kind of uh, uh, man mandala or something. So there's a lot of different fusion going on in the world right now. But I know that a lot of those henna artists, uh, you know, my book came out in March and they were already doing a lot of their henna art and then there was COVID already. So um, I know that a lot of them have had to stop doing henna on people because it's such a touch, you know, uh, art. You have to be able to be really close to people to do it. But, um, but no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's my book that is, you know, that is instigating their, uh, their newfound love of uh, trying to do henna. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, what I'd request is if we can stay on a bit longer, I'll just uh, request a representative from Radio 44, our radio partner, to kindly give um, a vote of thanks uh, and say hello to you officially. And thereafter, we will continue with uh, two votes of thanks from members of our club, and we can continue with the Q and A. If that's okay. Yes. Perfect. Uh, Hermina. Hermina represents uh, Radio Forty Four, a wonderful media partner for today, and uh, they have been advertising this event uh, very vocally, actually, on their radio station. And Hermina, if you're with us, can you please uh, say hello to our speaker? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody, and now. Ruby, and good morning to you, Alka, all the way in uh, California. We appreciate that you've woken up at one o'clock in the morning to be with us. <laughs> and it's been, it's been very, very um, inspirational to listen to you. Uh, uh, I actually first even had a question. What advice would you have for, to upcoming novices, authors in the making, who are struggling, um, you know, feeling down about when they're in the process of writing or getting their book published, especially because you persevered for 10 years. What would you say to them? I think that in writing, there are three things that you have to keep in mind. Perseverance, persistence, because I had to keep nudging my agent. I had to keep nudging her. Are we ready to publish yet? Are we ready to publish yet? And then the last is patience. So uh, I tend to be an impatient person. I want to get things done right away. Uh, but I just had to learn that the writing is going to be ready when it's ready. There is a lot of rewriting that happens with writing. So the henna artist that got published this year is probably my 30th version of this book. That's how many drafts it took me to get to this point. I had to rewrite the scenes over and over to make them more compelling. I had to keep going deeper and deeper into the characters to understand what their intention was. What did they want from this life? And did that intention change over time? I had to go through a lot of story arcs of each of the characters and figure out what is, how are they starting uh, in the beginning of the book and how are they going to end up? Where are they going to end up? How will that change have happened within them? Because we want to make sure that these characters feel real, right? So um, when characters feel real, 
you have to imbue them with strengths and weaknesses. They can't just be all good. They can't just be all bad. They have to be imperfect. So that's you know another piece of advice that I would give is uh, when you're developing characters, you want to go deeper and deeper and deeper, which means you're going to find some of the bad as well as some of the good in those characters. Um, and then I think another piece of advice would be that you want to study with people who have been recently published. When you study with people who, uh, authors who are published in the last, let's say, five, six years, they have contacts in the industry who can really help you. So when my book, for example, was sort of ready to be sent to an agent so that the agent could figure out if they wanted to work with me or not, my mentor uh, helped get that manuscript into her agent's hands. And it's so helpful when somebody can forward your manuscript on in that way, in a very personal way. Sending your manuscript blind to agents and publishers is a very difficult way to get published because many of those manuscripts will just sit in a big stack and never get read. There is just not enough time to read all the manuscripts that come to an agent's way. But if an agent or a publisher gets a letter from somebody saying, hey, uh, Susie, remember me? Um, you know, I, I wrote that book, blah, blah, blah. It was a bestseller. By the way, I have this manuscript from a friend. I think it's really good. Will you please have a, re have a read? They will definitely read something like that. So that's the other thing is if you're going to study with somebody, if you're going to take an online course, if you're going to do anything like that, please study with somebody who has published in the last five years uh, to six years, because that is going to stand you in good stead when your manuscript is ready to be sent around. So those are um, some of my sort of top line tips. I appreciate your asking. I'm per I personally am going to be teaching an online class that the Kepler's Literary Foundation asked me to, to do. And, uh, but I, I'm not sure that the time zone is gonna work out for Nairobi uh, folks, but um, you know, it's definitely fun to be able to tell people what my best practices are for writing, for publishing, and also for marketing. Because, you know, um, the other thing, Hermina, is that I found out writing is only one quarter of the process. The other parts of the process are to um, work, learn how to work collaboratively with agents and editors so that you listen to what they have to say. When they give you feedback on your work, that is gold. You have to listen, you have to be open to the idea that you don't know everything about the book. Maybe you're too close to it. Maybe you're not able to see the flaws, but they can because they're not close to it. So when they give you a piece of advice, be open and do the work to get it to the point where they are telling you to get it. Um, I, I just, I, I cannot stress enough how important that collaboration uh, is. So um, yeah, so those are some of the things that I would say. Does that help? <laughs> yes, it does. And I, you know, I'm sure um, we're going to put parts of this uh, conversation on our um, YouTube channel for the radio station and our social media. So I'm sure some of our uh, listeners and viewers, because we're an audiovisual station, will appreciate it. And did you ever, while writing the book, um, while you're working on it, did you ever think it would be made into a movie? You know, I actually saw it as a movie the entire time that I was writing, because that is the way I write. I write because I see everything visually in my head. I see the characters moving. I see um, the fabrics on the couches. I see what they're wearing, what the colors and patterns are that the characters are wearing. I see the paintings on the wall in a room that they're in. I see all of that. And then I imagine the characters start moving within that uh, scene. And then as they start moving, I think, no, I don't want this person to be sitting on the couch. I want them to be standing up. So then I redo the scene in my head and now they're standing up and they're saying other things to the other characters. So I keep doing that in my head. And then when I'm finally ready to put it down on paper, then I actually go to the computer and start putting it down. Otherwise, it, it's all just happening uh, in my head. So I saw the whole thing as a movie. And I think that is what appealed to the screen, screen adaptation companies when they got the book and they started, it started making the rounds in uh, Hollywood. 
uh, people said, wow, this is going to be really easy to bring to life because it's already all here. All of the description is here. All the colors and the sounds and uh, the sensations are all here in the book. Uh, this is going to be an easy transfer to the screen. So, uh, yeah, that's... So are you going I, to be involved in the, um, in the actual making of the movie in the sense where you have some creative control to ensure that your vision is actually um, portrayed in the movie as well? Yes, we wrote in an executive producer credit for me, which means I'm in the writer's room and I get to see the scripts. I get to understand whether these characters would actually be saying the kinds of things that they're writing. You know, I'll be able to say, no, I think Radha wouldn't quite say it that way. I think she might say it this way. Or I might be able to say, here is a transition scene that you can cut in between this major scene and that major scene. And this transition scene uh, would have these elements in it. So those are the kinds of things that I get to put in there. Um, uh, and I am just really looking forward to seeing what they do with it. I think that what they're billing it as, uh, Miramax TV, is uh, they're calling it an Indian Downton Abbey, which really made me comfortable because what they're going to do is to make it very lush. They're going to make it rich. They're going to make it colorful. Uh, they're going to make it the kind of series that they can hopefully continue for season after season after season, which would be really lovely. So when can we expect to, to see it on our screens? In a couple of years? Yeah, I think in a couple of years. And hopefully, I'm going to cross my fingers and toes that the pandemic will allow us to resume production in other countries. Uh, because the majority of this has to be filmed in Jaipur. And so we have to first get the uh, pandemic under control and then we can continue, uh, you know, uh, with the actual filming of this series. <laughs> On behalf of Radio 44, I'd like to thank you so much for your time and for this conversation. I'm sure a lot of uh, girls and daughters and mothers uh, are going to be inspired by reading the book. I have to admit, I haven't got a chance to read it yet, but it is on my list of things to do. And once again, thank you on behalf of Radio 44 and uh, to the Rotary Club as well. We're honored to be partnering with you on these great conversations that you're having. Thank you so much. You know, um, I was 51 when I started this journey and now I'm 62. And I feel like I have so much more to learn both about this uh, industry and just about writing. I hope to learn more about screenwriting as we start doing the TV series. And uh, I just uh, am always interested in reinventing myself and inventing new careers as I seem to have done every 10 or 15 years. So this, this is just another part of the journey for me. It's really an exciting place to be. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, um, to Hermina. I'd like to say a special thank you to Radio 44 for the wonderful partnership uh, and especially for promoting uh, a lot of material for, for this particular talk. And they're going to be streaming it as well. And uh, Hermina, we are always grateful for the wonderful um, assistance you provide us in, in our talks. Thank you, it's our pleasure. Thank you, Hermina. And uh, I'll now request um, Dr. Beatrice uh, to, to give a vote of thanks, uh, followed by our past president, Jessica Kazina. And thereafter, we do have some questions coming in. So, uh, uh, Alka, is, is it OK? Yes. <laughs> we'll take some 15 more minutes of your time. Yes, please. Wonderful. Dr. Beatrice? Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to. Uh, take this time on behalf of uh, the Rotary Club of Nairobi. It's a privilege, Alka, to have you here. We thank you for choosing to spend your time with us and especially this wee hour of the night. It's a real privilege to listen to such an inspiring story uh, because yours is, is a truly inspiring backstory of tenacity, enthusiasm, optimism and adaptation. Um, I'm particularly reminded of uh, a quote from Maya Angelou. She said, if one is lucky, a solitary fantasy can totally transform one million realities. And I think you're just starting 
uh, to have this impact. It's, it's wonderful to hear um, that you kept going and at that young age of 62, here we are, we're still changing the world. Um, we want to wish you great success with the Miramax project and given the array of accolades, including the New York uh, Times bestseller, uh, we expect nothing but the best. Two years seems like a long time to wait, but we shall sit and wait. And um, having recently uh, recommended that the Rotary Club of Nairobi has its own uh, book club. I'd like to put forward the Henna Artist as one of our uh, choice books. So we shall hopefully be getting back to you with lots and lots of detail and excitement. So we welcome you back to Rotary Club of Nairobi when you can. We'll try and make it a more godly hour, but we wish you the very, very best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beatrice. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Just Jessica. That was lovely. That's such lovely words. Uh, you know, um, if you would like to know how all of the, the words are pronounced and so on, because I have so many Hindi words in there, people tell me that the audiobook version is very uh, engaging and compelling. And I chose that narrator specifically for that reason. So if for some reason you don't get a chance to read the hard copy book, and if you're you know, traveling or in your car or you're able to listen to the audio version, that might be really interesting. But I That's love great. what you just said. I just think it's, it's amazing. I think you're so right. I think we just have to keep going, you know? What other choice do we have? We have to keep going. We have to keep moving ahead. That exactly. is the whole goal in life. Exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Jessica. And um, to our speaker, Ms. Alka Joshi, I'd like to say that uh, I have uh, benefited from reading uh, on Kindle your wonderful book, but I've also downloaded the audio version, which is, which is fascinating. Uh, I'd recommend everyone to, to get both versions, actually. And um, uh, you've you really found a very good uh, narrator for, for, for the audio version. Uh, we have you, some... know, you know what's so fascinating is you learn as an author what you have uh, some stake in and what you don't. So for example, I had no stake in the cover design. I thought that they would let me design the cover because it was my book, but they said, no, 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 we've got a department that does that. We know how to design a book that somebody wants to take up off the shelf. I said, oh, okay. And then I said, oh, I want to name the book, you know, The Enemy of the Crocodile. They said, no, 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 no. We're just going to, we're going to call it The Henna Artist. That's a better title. I was like, oh, okay. And then when they sent me all of the audiobook narrators, you know, they sent me five different narrators who were reading the same passage and I listened to them. And I thought, is this one of those where I don't get to tell them that I don't really like any of these narrators? So then I thought, okay, let me just take it upon myself to figure out a better narrator. So I started listening to all the audio uh, audiobooks on Audible where you can listen to the first five minutes for free. And I was listening to all of the books by Indian authors and this one, one woman uh, just really stood out, Sneha. And I, I said to Harper Audio, I went back and I said, could you please get her to do this audition? And they said, well, she's not really part of our you know, group that we normally uh, use. And I said, could you please? I really appreciate it. And so they did, and she was marvelous, hands down, perfect. So yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great listen. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have some further questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Margareta Vagasheru all the way from uh, many, many hours before us. Uh, she's she's pr probably in your time zone, <laughs> Dr. Margareta. Okay, she has a question. Um, she says, "Does uh, do you do you foresee any challenges in creating episodes for the TV series?" No, I don't think so at all. Uh, luckily, I think we're in, a, um, in an era now where we are tackling a lot of very difficult subjects. So we are tackling the issues of women, the choices that they have or don't have in their lives. Uh, we are tackling you know, all kinds of issues about um, you know, LGBTQ issues. We're tackling all kinds of political issues, racial issues in this world. So I don't think anything is off limits anymore. I think that we can create a series that is very true to the book and, um, you know, has a lot of, uh, tackles a lot of these uh, discussion points. Thank you. Thank you. I see Dr. Margareta has, has joined us now. Dr. Margareta? Uh, no, that, that's really, that, yeah, no, I was just saying that's really exciting. I think um, it's going to be um, a series that will go on for, for many seasons. If you carry through on what you're saying now, it'll be very exciting to see where she goes in her life and on this, in the series. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, We're excited. <laughs> And uh, do we have any further questions? Uh, Vice President Omi, um, Ambassador Josephine, <coughs> Dr. Anne. Rashmi. 
Yes, I think uh, we have gone through all the questions and we've taken up a lot of time. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, you know staying back and answering all our little and you know important and unimportant questions, the small things, uh, commenting on the color of your hair, <laughs> and things like. That. But we loved having you. I think it's a sign that we loved having you over. And you're welcome to Kenya anytime. And you want to write another book. Thank you. Yes, uh, we'll definitely do this again for the sequel. And then I look forward to um, talking to the book club if you guys end up reading The Henna Artist. That would be great. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Eileen. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Rashmi and Ritesh. Thank you so much for having Alka. This has been an enjoyable conversation. So thank you very much. And for your meaningful words, Dr. Beatrice and Josephine. Those words will stay with me for a long time. So thank you very much for your wonderful thank yous for Alka. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure. Have Great. a good afternoon. Thank you so Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, Jessica. Bye, Ritesh. Bye, Rashmi. Uh, bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alka. Okay, thank you. bye. Thank you, Margareta. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs>